And before I start, Senator Booker, I wanted to say that my professor and mentor at Columbia, uh, Paula Francisi, she's a housing attorney. She's really spoken so she, wonderfully yeah. about you. And I was thrilled to get the chance to chat with you just to tell you that she, in every class I've been in with her, has such nice things to say about you. Well, let me just uh, uh, say something that I really do believe this, whether good or bad, what we say about other people is more of a reflection of who we are than who they are. And um, she's a woman of in incredible grace and power. And I have learned a lot from her as well, even though she hasn't formally been my professor, but really, really has helped me around housing issues in particular. Yeah, of course. Your anecdote earlier in this call made me think of that. Um, but my real question is as a Gen Zer who has been working in policy and activism and at the intersection of tech and ethics, I've felt a lot of enthusiasm around what my generation is capable of, what we do, our unique perspective, our passion. But I also think that there's something to be said about also being practical, realistic, and understanding that every generation has its flaws. So I'm curious to hear from your perspective as a more senior policymaker, what are ways that you think that Gen Z needs to improve in our advocacy and in the way that we message our passion around issues to make sure that the change we're making is actually long lasting and isn't just us shouting into a void because that's what we've been told that we're good at? Wow, that's a heck of a question. Um, and it also puts me in the uncomfortable um, position of, of making generational broad, um, paint, paint a generation with a broad brush. As, as was said at the top of this conversation, Gen Z is so diverse and, and in every way, I'm not just talking about ethnically or religiously, but also diversity of views. And it's hard for me um, to sort of advise uh, a generation that gives me hope that, um, a lot of the, the narrow the narrowing of my thinking of the field of possibilities is re-expanded by a generation of people that don't subscribe to the limitations that often older people do. Um, I I just again I familiarized myself with a number of you before I got on this call, and I just felt a glow inside because you guys are entrepreneurs in the social space, and. Um, I just want you to keep doing that and and not letting yourself ever believe. And by the way, incremental change, like the farm bill right now is, um, I've, I've, you know, my staff and I, we had a strategy session. Let's blow it up. You know, like we were like very, and then we realized that's not, no, let's try to get singles and doubles done in this farm bill because I could connect a lot of those singles and doubles to making a big difference when I come home to Newark you know, like I, I, we created a three acre urban farm when I was mayor of the city and I go back there from time to time and see the impact that some of my farm policy creating uh, people that can now use their food stamps or their SNAP dollars to buy double uh, their the food at farmer's markets, how it's created more people going there. And I was there recently and some of the women came up to me and talked about curing their diabetes and reversing the, like literally a small little program helping to save lives and banish disease. And so I, I just, the, the only thing I wanna say to you is that uh, two things, uh, um, it, is, it, is, it is good to demand and think to swinging from the fences, but um, when I read, the, I try to read the people that most inspire me and read a lot about their lives. That's why I know a lot about the civil rights movement. They were also tactical and practical and uh, really, they expanded the moral imagination of a country, but they also found ways to get real wins. And sometimes they took many, many years. Um, I think that, you know, I, if there's anything I had to say generationally is, is really just never forget that change doesn't come from Washington. It comes to Washington by the activism of people. And your power is always going to be as a generation, as individuals, as communities that you cultivate. Um, it's going to come from you all just saying, I have power. No matter what you think, I have power. And, and the great thing about it, um, it, was very gener it was very generous to say um, about me being one of the early innovators on social media. Um, but I got on Twitter in 2009 and knew that it could be a, a revolutionary force in politics where I could disintermediate the media and go straight to the people in a way. 
And so we use the platform, Twitter used to use us in their advertising in the early days because we were finding such creative ways to get that, create a platform which any citizen could come on and tell me about something wrong in the city. I didn't want people just driving by their their, uh, streets and see a pothole and say, somebody should fix that. I wanted them to tweet the mayor and I would respond on it and show them that I could fix your potholes while in previous years, it took me months, I could get it done in hours. And it became this great thing I called we government, not e-government, but we government. But it also, I felt, had this activating where people said, wait a minute, I have power. I can demand change. I can speak to change. And the, the story I want to end with on this point is that because it you all are taking this story, I'm about to tell you, and taking it to whole new levels. I've seen some of the, the traction you all are getting, some of the breakthrough videos. But um, I, so I, when you're, I was mayor of Newark, which, which, was so disrespected by um, by people, looked down upon. Oh, don't go there, it's so dangerous. All these things that people wanted to, so in such a dark way, talk about my community. And it really annoyed me at a time that I was trying to expand opportunity, uh, bring in investment, create jobs, stimulate entrepreneurs. And I knew I had to change the media narrative around my city as a place of, of to stay away from, to a place to invest in, to partner with community-based organizations to do things. So long story short is, I'm at home one night watching The Tonight Show. Um, uh, And back then it was hosted by Conan O'Brien, who comes out and says, I hear Newark, New Jersey has a new healthcare program. And I had just done something to lower pharmaceutical prices for my residents, and I was proud of it. And so I'm like, oh oh my God, I'm getting mentioned on The Tonight Show, Newark? And then he goes, well, I think the best healthcare program for the city of Newark is a bus ticket out of town. And I just remember, I'm like, oh God. But it, it, but immediately I was thinking it differently in media. So I thought to myself, I gotcha. And, and I went to city hall the next day and sat behind uh, my desk, had like a college, recent college graduate stand there with a, with a, with a little video uh, uh, you know, phone or whatever it was at that time. And I just said, I, mean, I just say, hey, I'm very serious. I'm, you know, I'm a Cory Booker. I'm the mayor of Newark, New Jersey. Um, and then I talked about how great my city is. And I said, Conan O'Brien, the, the host of the Tonight Show, has insulted our city, and thereby, uh, by the power vested in me by the people of the city of Newark, I hereby ban Conan O'Brien from Newark Airport. You're on the no-fly list. Try JFK, buddy. And and it was it was a joke. <laughs> uh, but I put it online and the video went viral. It went so viral that literally, like I'm getting angry calls from civil libertarians telling me that I can't willy nilly put somebody on a no fly list. We had cameras now in front of city hall, satellite trucks, not because somebody got murdered, but to figure out what was going on. The TSA, I'm not exaggerating, clarified on their website that mayors in America don't have the power to put people on the no fly list. It started to become one of the bigger stories of that week in in America. And then Conan O'Brien goes on The Tonight Show and plays my video that now had been seen by hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people. Now he plays it to his 2.5 million viewers. And then he says, Corey, you want to ban me from Newark Airport? By the power vested in me by a studio audience, I'm banning you from Burbank Airport. I'm like, "I I fly LAX anyway, but okay. And it was on. Before you know it, I film another video. This story gets bigger and bigger. And now the mayor of Newark, New Jersey is getting invited on every big show from afternoon chew and chat uh, uh, shows to to Larry King and late night CNN shows bragging about my city, getting great earned media, but also carrying on this this fight. It ended because this, this woman who was in charge of literally finding peace around the world, healing war-torn areas, she was a secretary of state for the United States of America, Hillary Clinton, filmed her own video that she posted basically saying, Corey Conan, give peace a chance. And next thing you know, I'm invited on The Tonight Show um, where Conan O'Brien apologizes to the city of Newark, gives us half a million dollars for charities in Newark, and, and, uh, and, and puts us in a position where now suddenly the city's getting a lot more attention, positive attention, and I'm able to call businesses, investments, and stuff like that, and get more investment in my city. It was a disruption. It was creative thinking. At a time that we were in a global recession, we found ways to expand our parks when other cities were cutting back, get resources for uh, uh, um, uh, affordable housing that other cities were losing. And so what I'm saying to you is that 
you all have a creativity and an imagination and power that my generation might not even be thinking about because we're not mastering tools or innovators in the same way that Dorothea Cotton and James Bevel were the young innovators of their time that captured national media attention that helped to advance radical change. You all have that power as well. And don't turn to a middle-aged bald guy uh, to, to, to get advice about what to do. But if I hope if there's anything that can inspire you is that you have to do it because young generations in their teens and 20s before you, going back to the Alice Paul and the suffragettes I talked about, have taken on their responsibility saying, I'm not going to yield to the injustices around me. I'm going to access my power and, and change the reality, bend that arc of the moral universe.